Hey, so good afternoon. Very good. Okay. So um, I just want to have to move my camera a little bit so you get my face such as it is. <laughs> okay, now um, last week we had a, a general kind of outline and uh, perhaps some of you weren't there last week. So let me just very briefly repeat what we said last week. This coming year is a Shemitah year. How do I know it's a Shemitah year? Well, of course, because uh, everyone tells me, but there's another way of knowing it's a Shemitah year. The year coming on Rosh Hashanah is 5782. And if the number of the year is divisible by seven, that means it's a Shemitah year. So if you divide 5782 by seven, uh, you get uh, 56, that's one, carry one, 18, that's carry two, Two K four forty two is divisible by seven. So not because the Shemitah year started in year one, it didn't. It didn't start until fourteen years after we came to Eretz Israel, and then there was a break. But it so happens that the year, if the year is divisible by seven, you know it's a Shemitah year. So you'll always know what year it is in the cycle. Okay. So now we have, as we said before. The Torah is very, uh, it's very strict on the Shemitah year. And it's very important. I'll repeat what I said last week. The Pasha dealing with Shemitah is in Baha Sinai, that the Almighty gave the mitzvah Shemitah on Ha Sinai. And whereas it gave all the mitzvahs on Ha Sinai, it doesn't say that. It says that specifically on the Shemitah year. And that, I believe, shows the importance of the Shemitah year in relation to Eretz Yisrael. The verse says seven times it talks about the, the land should rest. And uh, we know that an essential element of our being here in Eretz Yisrael, an essential element of our being in Eretz Yisrael is that we keep the Shemitah year. In the same way that Shabbos during the week is really the tachlis, the purpose, the completion of the whole week. So Shemitah is in a sense a very essential element of our being in Eretz Israel. There is a question of whether the Shemitah year applies now from the Torah or only from the Rabbana. And many years, are, many mitzvahs relating to the land apply today in Eretz Yisrael, Truma, Maisa. The question of the Shemitah depends on interpretation. There are those that say that because it uh, is, in a sense, part of the whole procedure of the Yovel, the Jubilee, which is seven, year, seven cycles of seven. So in a sense, the Shemitah year <coughs> is an element of the Yovel, the Jubilee, which is once every 50 years. And since the Yovel, the Jubilee, doesn't apply now, Shemitah doesn't apply. Why doesn't the Yovel, the Jubilee, apply? Because it requires everyone to be in the land that is to be divided among the tribes and within the tribes, among the families, and that hasn't happened yet. That will be a much later stage in the Gu'ula, in the return of the Jewish people. So according to that view, the Shemitah year does not yet apply. The Shulchan Aruch, Beis Yosef, holds that the Shemitah year becomes applicable from the Torah when the majority of Jews are living in Eretz Yisrael. And uh, it seems clear that it's about the time now that probably that the majority of Jews in the world are living, or almost the majority. So according to that view, there might well be a, a law that the Shemitah year is from the Torah now. And uh, the Chazanish, for example, other people that do hold that the Shemitah year is from the Torah. What is the practical difference if the Shemitah year is from the Torah or it's only from the Rabban? The practical difference, there are two questions. One is that in the seventh year, 
one of the things which we should study is that the produce of the that the land has kedusha, which is that it has a, a holiness, and the produce of the land has a holiness. So the question would be: Is that only applicable when the shemitah year is from the Torah, and that when it's not from the Torah, we don't have the kedusha? So we shall see that even if we hold it's only from the rabbis, nevertheless, we practice the Kedusha. We practice the way that we eat, the way we deal with the produce, the way we are allowed to sell or buy, whatever. We treat it as uh, that it has Kedusha. And therefore, it seems reasonable to say that the produce of the land during the Shemitah year that will be starting in a month or so, has a kedusha. What does that mean in practical terms? Apart from various halakha, it means that when something has a kedusha, it's treated separately. Kedusha really means a separation. It's separated from our normal activities, from the normal laws. So therefore, the fruit of the Shemitah year has a special quality which removes it from our ordinary activity of planting, growing, dealing with fruit. There is a special quality to that. There will be a very important distinction about whether that only applies to land which is owned by Jews or else, or what about land that non-Jews own in Israel, land occupied by Arabs particularly, or by any non-Jew that has land in Israel. I don't want to go into the question of whether they own the land or not, but for practical purposes, if they are working the land and growing produce, will that produce have produce or not? This will be a very important question that we shall consider. The other important question, whether the Torah applies or not, is that Shemitah in one aspect is a very fundamental question of a moon of faith in the Kaddish Baruch If you tell a farmer or in, in, a, in an agricultural community that there's a year where he's not allowed to grow anything and the land has to, has to uh, lay fallow, what am I going to eat? So the Almighty says, don't worry, I guarantee you that there will be enough for you to eat, either what's left over from the sixth year or coming into the eighth year, but don't worry about that. Is that so only if it's from the Torah? In other words, the Kodesh Baruch Hu says, if you keep my Torah, you don't have to worry. But if it's not from the Torah, it's from the rabbis, and we're taking kumras, we're taking additional strictness, maybe that guarantee doesn't apply. Maybe the Almighty says, when it's from the Torah, I'll guarantee it. But in the meantime, you have to take your own chance. Well, there are different views about that. The Chazan Ish holds that the guarantee still applies, but it, you're not supposed to rely on that. So therefore, we'll see as we go through that there are various ways in which we are allowed to get food during the Shemitah year. Um, as I said, it will have a Kedusha, it will be different, but you don't have to worry, the Kodesh Baruch will take care of it. Okay. So now I, I dealt with that last week in more detail. I just wanted just as an introduction. And there are four principal mitzvahs, four principal areas of the Shemitah year that concern us that we'll have to discuss as we go through the class. The first one is a prohibition on working the land. I'll give the details of what working the land means. But that relates principally to the, to the Torah, says you're not supposed to work the land, and there will be four specific activities that the Torah describes, and then in addition, there'll be all the rabbinical. So we'll have to discuss what's forbidden so far as working the land is concerned. That's number one. Number two will be the fruit of the land. When I use the word fruit, I don't mean specifically the fruit that grows from a tree. I mean all produce vegetables, uh, legumes, grains, 
anything that comes that grows from the land, as I said before, that is in general subject to Kedusha. And there were specific laws relating both to how that, how that produce can be picked, how it can be dealt with by the farmer and the shop, and the individual, how he can acquire it in the first place. And secondly, how he deals with that produce, so far as eating is concerned, so far as refuge is concerned, what are the limits that he's allowed to do. So that's going to be very important for most people who don't own land. That is the most important practical aspect of the Shemitah. What can you buy? How do you buy it? And what do you do with it when you bought it? That's number two. Number three is a thing called bio, which means that when a crop, a particular crop, is no longer in the field, the time for growing and picking that crop has passed, so you're not allowed to keep supplies of it in your house. It's called bio, we'll deal with that in due course, that's number three. And number four, the fourth, area is nothing to do with land or produce at all, it's to do with loans. And we have a, a law that a, a, a lender is not allowed to demand payment from the borrower, according to most views, at the end of the Shemitah year, so that, that means that the Shemitah year, in a sense, wipes out loans, or at least it wipes out the obligation to repay the loan and we'll discuss that also in due course that will be the fourth thing but today I want to start with the first area of Shemitah which is the working of the land now first of all when do the, the prohibitions let's say there are main prohibitions from the tour are plowing the land planting, pruning, and other work on trees and, and picking, harvesting. So when does all that start? Does that start on Rosh Hashanah or does that start before Rosh Hashanah? So it depends on what we're talking about. Uh, the halacha is that when the base of Mikdash was standing on shall be standing, so then working the land was forbidden 30 days before Shemitah. That's called Tosefet Shemitah, Tosefet Shemitah. In the same way as we have a Tosefet on Shabbos, we start Shabbos before, before Shkir. We light the candles before Shkir. So, and we stop work, we're not allowed to do Malacha, so that's an addition. So also in Shemitah they had an addition. And they said at the time of the Beis Hamikdash, it was forbidden to plow the land in a, a field that's going to be used to grow uh, produce from Pesach. Why? Because the plowing of the land is a preparation for planting. And therefore, if we start, we're not going to be allowed to to plow even as, even from Pesach. And in a field of trees, we were not allowed to plow from Shavuos because plowing also helps the trees to grow. Uh, but today we're not, we don't apply those laws because the Pesach Mikdash is not standing, but there should be at least a certain addition. For example, I'll give you a couple of examples. You're not supposed to plant a fruit tree less than 44 days before Shemitah, less than 44 days before Rosh Hashanah, which is the 15th of Av. So that in other words, we're talking about another week or so. You have another week or so to plant. If you want to plant trees, you have a garden, you want to plant a tree, a fruit tree, you only have another week or so to do that. The year of Orla, as you know, that fruit is forbidden for the first three years of the growth of a tree, and the fourth year it has special laws. 
And that view of all us starts on Rosh Hashanah. So therefore, and that only starts within 44 days beforehand, because it takes 14 days in general for the tree, if you plant a, stri a stripling or a young tree, takes 14 days, they say, for the for it to be uh, collected by the, by the land. And 30 days is because it's like a year. 30 days is like a year. So we want to start a year before the Shemitah. So that's 30 days. And there's 14 days before the, the, before the tree or the plant is uh, collect is taken in by the by the, by the by the by the so the first thing we said is that today you're not supposed to plant fruit trees for more than less than 44 days so uh, before Shemitah now What about planting vegetables or things like that? So the question will be when they will start to grow. If they won't start to grow, and I think that will probably mean above the ground in certain cases, before Shemitah, then we're also not allowed to plant them before Shemitah because we have a problem with things that grow on Shemitah, vegetables and the like. So therefore, vegetables and the like, you should not plant those unless you know that they're beginning to grow and you're going to see the growth of the plant before the Shemitah year. If you're not going to see the growth of the plant before the Shemitah year, you shouldn't plant it before the Shemitah year. And a tree which doesn't grow fruit, you are allowed to plant after the Shemitah year. Now, what about... Uh, grains and legumes, kidneys. You have to plant them before the Shemitah year to the extent that a third of the growth will be before Shemitah year. In other words, I can't plant uh, legume vegetable, uh, legumes or, 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 or uh, grain now unless I know that a third of the growth will be before the Shemitah year, which is not going to happen. So therefore, we see in general that we have to be very careful before the Shemitah year in planting a crop that will only come up in the Shemitah year. What about other work? We'll see in a few moments there's a lot of work that is forbidden to do on Shemitah. So the answer will be also, that kind of work you shouldn't do to the last minute. If you can do it beforehand, you should fix, you should do it before, and you shouldn't wait to the last minute. Okay. Unless there is what's going to be called a loss. I'll talk about that in a minute. So the Torah says that you have to rest from plowing and from picking fruit or, or crop. And you shouldn't, and it also says you shouldn't plant your field, which is talking about uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. So we say, and it also says your vineyard, you should not prune. So we have these, these four different specific things that are mentioned in the Torah. Plowing, katsia, which is uh, some kind of harvesting, and sowing, and pruning. Okay. So let's go through one by one. Even those things which we see and we we'll learn you're allowed to pick and harvest, you shouldn't pick and harvest them in the normal way. You have to make a change. First of all, a change in the quantity 
of how much you harvest. You can only harvest two or three meals at a time. And also in the manner that you harvest them. Um, whether you change, if you do it by hand, whether you change how you do it, if you use a tool, you change how you do it. So therefore the harvesting, which would be permitted, has to be done in a particular way. We'll come, to, and that's particularly talking about uh, fruit, because there's a, a bigger problem in harvesting vegetables, which I'll come to in a little while. You're also, as I said, not allowed to, to, to plow. And plowing will include a number of things. Um, would you like plowing? We'll come to that specifically in, in a little while. And, and I said finally, planting. So it also says that you're not allowed to prune a tree. Why? Because pruning helps to grow it. So if you're not allowed to prune an existing tree, surely you're not allowed to plant a new tree. So we learn from that as well, that you're not allowed to plant new trees in the Shemitah. Okay, so so that in general, we could say therefore, that you're not allowed to plant, you're not allowed to prune. You have to be very careful in harvesting and the rabbis will now add a considerable amount of other acts which are forbidden because they improve the growth of the produce. In general, we will say that you're not allowed to do any activity which will improve the produce. That includes watering. That includes weeding. That includes clearing the ground, leveling the ground. Uh, all works on trees to remove the um, worms and stuff like that, that, they, that they, they burn on trees or they paint things on trees. It will also include pruning. It will also include removing dead branches. Anything that will help the growth or stimulate the growth or the quality of the produce is forbidden on Shemitah. What is permitted on Shemitah is to prevent the plants from growing at all. You can't deny them water if, if they'll die. So you're allowed to water plants sufficient for them to grow. If you have weeds that are throttling the plant, you're allowed to weed, take away those weeds so that the plant can live. So it's a fine line between watering to improve and watering to keep alive. And like anything else, in Halakha we have lines. This is permitted, that's forbidden. So in general, if you have a garden, if you have a garden and you have things growing, so your gardener, you should know how much water to give. If you have your water on a drip system, instead of the water coming twice a day, probably enough if it comes twice a week. And in the winter where there's rain, when there's rain, then you don't need the watering at all. Same thing with, same thing with weeding. If the weeds are throttling the plant, you're allowed to remove them, but you're not allowed to remove weeds just to make it grow better. I'll come to gardens in a moment. The question, the, 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 the first question is, to what do these restrictions apply? So first of all, it only applies in Israel and the Halakha will define what is considered Israel for this place. One time, Gush Katif was not considered this way. Now we don't have Gush Katif, so it's not really relevant. What about the East Bank? What about the South, going south towards Iraq? So there are various halakhas about this, different people have different 
positions and you rely when we come to where you buy whether it's considered within Eretz Yisrael. So let's say it's in Eretz Yisrael. Most of us are living in Eretz Yisrael. The question is, well, now what, what is forbidden? Is it just the land? That's to say outside in the field. What about inside in the house? The, the, the Talmud Yerushalmi discusses whether things grown in a house are within the prohibition or not. It doesn't come to an answer. And in general, the stricter view is that things that grow in a house are still subject to the laws of Schmidt. Now, what about if it's not grown on the ground? It's grown in a pot. Uh, you grow a pot or in a box, or a lot of people grow things in, in boxes, in containers, particularly in pots. Are they considered with the, on the ground or not? So the first question is whether there is a hole in it. Most flower pots, for example, have a hole in it. If the hole in it is sufficiently large for the plant to draw nourishment from the ground, so then that's considered like the ground. There's a whole question in the laws of Shabbos that if, if something's in a pot and you, on a table, you put it on the ground, where that's called planting, etc. So in general, if the pot or the container has a hole, which is next to the ground, that's considered as if it's in the ground. What about if the pot does not have a hole? So then the question will be, what's it made of? If it's made of earthenware, so the nourishment passes through earthenware. If you were to put a pot even without a hole in it on the ground, but the nourishment will, the, the, the nourishment and the moisture of the ground will go through the earthenware, so that would be considered forbidden. But what about if I put a separation between the pot and the ground? depend on what kind of separation. If I put a metal separation, or I put glass, or thick plastic, then that would generally be considered a separation, which means that that would not then be considered growing on the ground. So therefore, the more of these uh, leniencies that apply, the more permissible it would be to go. For example, if you're not on the ground floor, if you're certainly on the fifth, sixth, seventh floor, my opinion, there is no Easter of growing things in pots or, or containers because that's not on the ground. You have all the floors of the house. What about if the floor is cemented? Well, I don't think that that on its own will not necessarily help you because you know, if you put a flower pot or something on a cemented surface, then when you remove it, you'll see that moisture, there, was, there would be a circle of moisture that had come through. So in itself, if it's cemented, that is not sufficient. What about if it's cemented on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's in a house. It's not in a field, it's in a house, there's a roof over it. So now you have two factors to permit it. If you were to add a third factor, which was that underneath the pot, you would put some thick plastic or some other uh, metal or strong separation between the pot and the, and the earth, and it's also cemented. So then you're already getting into a position where um, you no longer have a problem of planting or of working that crop because it's not considered part of the land. And that will be one of the main uh, hedges, the main reasons to permit crop that's grown because it would be grown, let's say on a table or some separation from the ground and then on plastic or something, and uh, then in a pot without a hole in it, all these things will help. Of course, the trouble is that you can't grow everything like that. So if it's not going to grow like that, that doesn't help you. So then we'll have to find some other, some other way of doing that. Okay, so now let's talk about a couple of practical things. Supposing 
you're a landlord and you rent your house out and the house has a garden, are you responsible if the tenant grows things in the garden or does work in the garden which is forbidden? So the proper thing to do is you have to tell him that he's not allowed to do that. You don't want him to do that in Shemitah. If nonetheless he does it, uh, whether that would entitle you to terminate the tenancy and throw him out of the house, that's a difficult question. If it was written specifically in the tenancy agreement that he is not allowed to work the garden on Shemitah and he has to observe the Shemitah laws, then it's possible that that would be considered a breach of contract and you could uh, terminate the tenancy. But in any event, you should tell him clearly, your tenant, that you want him to comply with the laws of Shemitah. What about if you live in a Bad Meshutaf, in a house like many people in, in Jerusalem, they live in a house where they have a number of apartments and they have a garden and you pay a Vada Bayat every month which includes the work in the garden. So now, if the majority, if the, the, it's in a religious area and the people all agree not to work in the garden, there's no problem. What happens if it's if not all the people in the house are religious and, or observe, not, I shouldn't say not religious, don't observe Shemitah. So now, what's your responsibility? Well, you have to tell them you don't want them to do it, but they don't take any notice. So now you have to pay Vada Bayat every month. So the Vada Bayat is going to pay for the garden. So you should say specifically that you want your Vada Bayat money to go for electricity, other general upkeep of the, of the property or not the garden. If they don't take any notice, you should not refuse to pay because then they'll take you to court and you'll have to pay anyway. So you pay under protest. If they're notwithstanding that you say, I don't want you to do this work, they're going to do it and they charge you Vada Bayat, so you have to pay the Vada Bayat under protest. Now, what about ornamental? Ornamental. Uh, let's say you have a garden. And the work in the garden is not to stimulate growth, but it's for beauty. You, let's say they, they, uh, there's a, a lawn and they mow the lawn. They're not mowing the lawn. If they're mowing the lawn so that things will grow better, no. But if you're mowing the lawn just so that it looks neat and tidy and presentable and it's for beauty rather than for growth, then that's permitted. Anything that is for beauty and not for growth is permitted. Also, let's say your um, the weeds are very high and you're worried about snakes, God forbid, or something like that. So then you would certainly be allowed to to cut the cut the lawn if it was to make sure that there are no snakes or dangerous any other dangerous things going on. So if it's just for ornamentation, that's okay. If it's also to prevent damage, that's okay. What about like say flowers? Are we allowed to pick flowers on Schmitter? Well, if you want to pick the flower in order to, that you have flowers for your vase for, as I've said before, that's permitted. But if by picking the flowers or cutting the flowers, you increase the growth and more flowers are going to grow, so then that's a problem. Uh, and either you buy flowers that come from the flowers or they're grown in a way which is permitted, as I've said, and under cover and with various uh, protection from the earth. But you have to be careful with flowers to make sure that uh, they're not cut in such a way that, in, that will improve the growth. This is also true for other, other things that you can do. Let's say uh, for sukkahs, 
we'll talk specifically about sukkas. But in the meantime, let's say you want to cut uh, your lulu, or you want to cut schach, particularly schach, right? In the old days, nowadays, everyone, most people have uh, pre-made schach. But a few years ago, most people had schach that was cut down. Now, it's true that that's cut down for use of schach. That's not forbidden. But you have to be careful how you cut it down, because maybe that will improve the growth. And in general, they say when you cut things down, if you're cutting wood for firewood, or you're cutting schach to use in sukkahs, you should cut it not in the way that you normally cut it. Cut it with a shinui. Generally speaking, with rabbinical laws, if we do a shinui or a change, then that shows that we are aware that we're doing something unusual and that it's forbidden to do it in the normal way. So cutting things for, now cutting things like pruning is, is definitely a problem because the purpose of pruning is to increase the growth and that's forbidden. So pruning you're not supposed to do. But if you're cutting, let's say wood for firewood or as I said, schach for sukkahs or something like that, you should do that, but you should do that with a shinui, with a change. So, uh, in general, let's, let's summarize a little bit the question of the, the working of the land. Now, there are other things you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to take stones off of a field because stones off of a field is preparing to grow. So, even if you're not going to grow or plant that year, if in the, you're waiting, you're not going to plant until the next year, nevertheless, you're not allowed during Shemitah year to prepare the ground. So that certainly includes plowing, but it also includes clearing stones or leveling the, leveling the ground or removing weeds and things like that. So now if you're gonna build, you're allowed to build, so you, you can clear the, the area where you're gonna build of stones where it's clear that you're gonna do that for building. There's already tractors, there's already paths of building material there. So then in that case, you're allowed to remove stones and flatten the ground and prepare for building. But you have to be careful that you do it in such a way that it's clear that that is for the purpose of building and not for the purpose of preparing land for, for a planting. Okay. Um, so when I talked about plowing, which was forbidden, so that includes, as I said, removing stones and, and weeds and things like that, and leveling the land and uh, digging holes that you're going to use for planting. Any kind of activity which is a preparation for planting is also forbidden. Um, Now, within the, within the uh, definition of what's forbidden so far as trees are concerned, so I said pruning, but there are other things which are forbidden, which we also see are forbidden in Shabbos, which is uh, grafting. You're not allowed to graft something on a tree. You're not allowed to take a branch and dig it under the ground, drift it up somewhere else, so it'll go somewhere else. Um, Anything which is going to improve the growth, you're not allowed to do. Uh, now, we will come in a little while to a very complex, important matter about not fruit, but vegetation, vegetables. You're not allowed, as I say, to plant vegetables in the Shemitah year. But as we shall see in general from the Torah, the, you're allowed to eat the food of the Shemitah year. So we will say, however, that if someone plants a vegetable during the Shemitah year, the rabbis will say, you're not allowed to eat the fruit of that. That's called speaking, and they'll have a separate class on that. Now, what about if the plant 
there's a plant which you didn't plant. It grows on its own from seeds that fall, it grows on its own. Are you allowed to eat the fruit of that? So in principle, since you didn't plant the since you didn't plant the plant, you should be allowed to eat the fruit. But however, the rabbis are and always were aware that people come up with all kinds of devices and excuses. So we're concerned that they will say, well, the, the thing grew on itself. I didn't plant this lettuce. I didn't plant these beans, etc. They grew on themselves. So therefore we say, even if they grew on themselves, you know, we have a blanket, we'll have a blanket prohibition of eating produce that a, of, that a Jew could have planted or is on Jewish land. But that does not apply. Now, let me just I'll come into now this question of land that is, I'm going to say owned, I don't really want to say it, is worked by Arabs. Let's say the Arabs have been there, they consider they own the land. Well, the non Jews have no restrictions. The laws of Shemitah. So far as what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do only applies to Jews. Uh, it applies to Jews working on his own land. It would apply to Jews working for someone for a non-Jew. If a non-Jew hires Jews, the Jews aren't allowed to work for them. It also applies to Jewish land if a non-Jew works for it. So whether the land is Jewish, owned by a Jew, or whether the Jew is working on it, these prohibitions apply. But what about if the land is, quote, owned by non-Jews, Arabs, and they plant, and then they allow to harvest the crop? That, there's nothing wrong with that. But the question is, what is the law relating to that crop? Does that crop, which was planted by Arabs in, on their own land, have a producer of shoes? And that will affect very much the question of whether we can buy that, how we buy it, how we deal with that land, with that produce, whether we can cook it, what happens with the refuge and all the rest of the stuff we're going to be learning. So that's a difference of opinion that goes back to the Gemara. Whether the, uh, if land is owned in possession of a non-Jew, whether that removes the Kedusha or not. So there was always a difference of opinion in that matter between the Jerusalem school and the Bnei Brak school. The Jerusalem school, I said this last time, but I'll say it again, it's important to know. The Jerusalem view, the rabbis in Jerusalem, particularly the Hasidim, but also all the Jewish community of Jerusalem held that Produce from land owned and farmed by Arabs did not have Kedusha. And therefore you can buy crops, particularly let's say from Arab merchants, but even from Jewish merchants that have no, that clearly came from Arabs. How do we know? Well, they used to send people into the fields, but that's a little bit, could be a little bit dangerous these days. I heard that they have helicopters looking to see where the crop came from. Assuming that you know that the crop comes from Arabs, does that have Kedusha or not? So I say the Jerusalem rabbis held that it did not, and the Bnei Brak rabbis following uh, the Chazanish held that it did have Kedusha. That will make a very big difference. Can I buy vegetables from Arabs? Of their, which I know, for I can rely on the fact that it came from their fields. And if I do buy them, how do I have to treat that? So, as I said before, most of the Jerusalem rabbis held that there was no problem, but the Maybach did. But nowadays, more and more of the authorities in Jerusalem are also concerned that it has Kedusha, which will affect how I buy it, how I can buy it, how I treat it when it's bought in relation to what I can cook and what I can, can't do, what I can blend it, what I do with the refuge, etc. Uh, and you'll decide according to your rabbi, I can't suck for you, but in general I would say that these days 
more and more people are treating that crop with Kedusha. One thing is that they don't like to buy from Arabs because we don't know what their money may be going to uh, finance all kinds of um, terrorism. But leaving that aside, even if I do, since the mitzvah of Shemitah, mitzvah Asa, and there is a very positive aspect in keeping Shemitah, there's a very good reason to say since very respectable opinions hold that it has Kedusha, we will take that position and therefore the hour of produce we will treat with Kedusha and therefore we're required to deal with it in the way that I'm going to talk about in the next week. Um, so, so that's very important. Let me summarize. So far as planting is concerned and plowing and pruning and those works which improve the crop, there's a division if they're from the Torah or from the rabbis. If uh, they're from the Torah, they're absolutely forbidden. If they're from the rabbis, all the work which helps the growth, like water, etc., etc., watering, clearing stones, clearing weeds, uh, taking off dead branches, so that will depend. If it's to improve the crop, it's forbidden. If it's to save the crop, it's permitted. If it's purely for decorative purposes, it's permitted. If it's not on the ground, so then we come to the question of if it's, if it's in a, a, a house. For example, a greenhouse, if it's still on the ground, that doesn't help you. But if it's separated from the ground, which means that it's in a pot or a container, which doesn't have a hole large enough for nourishment to come through. And I'm now going to add that I'm going to put a separation between that pot or that container on the ground, a thick piece of plastic or metal. Or I'm going to raise it up from the ground to a degree that it will no longer draw nourishment, then that's permitted. And in my opinion, once you get up to the first, second, third floors, so then you don't have a problem. There's no nourishment from the ground because you have two or three uh, floors in between and the nourishment will not come up. Um, but on the whole, work that you can do before Shemitah, you should do before Shemitah. Uh, you only have a week or so to plant new trees. Uh, and the less work we do the better because we have a mitzvah, the Shemitah is a positive mitzvah. I said last week I saw a very beautiful thought that on Rosh Hashanah, when we say Shechiyonu, when we start our Rosh Hashanah meal, we should, and we say Shechiyonu, which is on the mitzvahs of Rosh Hashanah, particularly let's say the shofar, you should also have in mind Shechiyonu that we've come to this Shemitah year, which gives us the opportunity to perform um, any questions that you have, you should ask the rabbi. There are lots of things which I didn't particularly go to. Moving, if you're moving houses, so now you're, you have plants in your old house, which is, which is above the ground and they're separated all the rest of it. Now you're moving to another house. So you'll have the same thing in the other house. But in the meantime, if you're carrying it, what about carrying it across gardens, carrying it across the land? Is that considered, is that considered, uh, now it's connected to the ground a little bit. Well, it gets some nourishment from the ground. How do I deal with that? So those things you should have to ask a rabbi. The reason is because you shouldn't decide on your own that it's all right. If you ask a rabbi and he says it's all right, but you should put a, let's say you should put a blanket or something underneath so it's separated. So when you follow it, the, the, that instruction, so you're all right. But to make up your own mind on these things, you shouldn't. You shouldn't move pots from one in one house to another house when that's going over the ground. 
all these things are examples of how instead of looking at it in a negative way, I can't do this, I shouldn't do this, we could try to look at it in a positive way that by doing this, I am complying with the laws of Shemitah and, I'm, and that is such an enormously important aspect of the life of the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael. So much so that one of the reasons, God forbid, that people were expelled was because they didn't keep the Shemitah. Okay, so now what I'd like, if anyone has some questions, practical questions, ask me the questions now or send them in and I'll answer them specifically in the following week. Someone last week asked about fixing a water system which had broken. So I, my opinion, we should do that now before Shemitah comes in. We shouldn't wait until Shemitah comes in to fix a water system. Okay, any, anyone have any other questions or anything they'd like to ask or comment on? No, if not, okay, so we'll close there. And next week, I will begin the, the topic, which is more relevant to most of us, what kind of produce I can buy, how I could buy it, how I can acquire it, and what I do with it when I've acquired it in relation to cooking, and what I do with the refuge, etc., etc. Okay? Be well, Carlton.